Lord, we just come to you again. We thank you uh, so much again for this time that we have together. We thank you for your word. Lord, you're, uh, you're just truly an awesome and glorious God. And we thank you, Lord. We ask that you attend to these prayer requests. Uh, according to your will, we pray that whatever whatever you have for us uh, in our lives, Lord, that we bring, we bring you glory in your decision uh, for your sovereign, your control, Lord, even if it's death, and we pray like, we praise you like Job, that though you slay us, we'll praise you. Lord, again, thank you so much for everything you've given us. In Christ's name, amen. Pastor Ellen's got the uh, notes. Right. We'll let those be passed on. Thank you, buddy. Hey, we need more. I do. That's not the same. Oh, 15 to 44. Well, we're not going to play that. Or we might need to. Good? Good. Hurry. Hurry. Pass out faster. Good. 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 Okay. And again, I just basically print you my sermon, my lesson. So you got what I've got, and uh, there's other stuff. I just don't think we're going to get to. Everything. This is the last Sunday of February, right? Yep. All right. So this is this is it. Uh, for this. So we have to make it. Don't think we're going to quite do that, but we're going to shoot for it. Okay. We've got a little less than an hour. Please feel free to ask questions. <laughs> Matthew chapter twenty-four, verses fifteen through forty-four. Last week we looked at the. Uh, First part of verse 15, and that was concerning the abomination of desolation. The desolation. Uh, that's what happens when the Antichrist puts his image up in the temple as God. Uh, midway point, or midway through the tribulation. Uh, remember, he he uh, he puts his image up in the holy of holies, causes the world to worship him. Um, and that's what takes place at the midway point. That's what Jesus warns us about. Uh, Last week we looked at a lot of uh, parallel passages uh, throughout the scriptures to really just to con- kind of confirm that event. Uh, it's not, you know, we're not just making this stuff up. Uh, we're not just pulling it out of the air. We're not talking about helicopters and, you know, silliness. We're not sensationalizing this stuff. We're all confirming this with scripture, right? Uh, again, if you, if you get those notes that uh, from last week in the handout, uh, there you go. If you need them, we'll get them for you. Um, you know, I got an email and all that kind of stuff. So I got a question. Go ahead. This, this when they set this antichrist up in a sense, what do you think that's going to look like? You know, it's going to be on TV. Yeah. I know, uh, so it probably, um, of course, we don't know. I know well, right. the condition of the world as far as economics and things like that. Uh, we do know that the world sees events unfold and. <laughs> Only way the world can see it, each and every individual, is through a TV or something like that. Um, but I mean, all, all we need could be his image. Who knows? Other than he has made an abomination and he's caused the world to worship him. Uh, probably his image up in the temple uh, as God. Um, so he, he's again Second Timothy. Uh, excuse me, Second Thessalonians chapter two says that he exalts and magnifies himself above all that is God. Uh, Which be it looks like it didn't include the temple. Yeah, so it probably. Sense. Yeah, well, we know it's the temple. Yeah, uh, we know he does something in the temple. It's an abomination of desolation. That's what that that in, that in carries the idea of being in the temple. Uh, it's the at the midway point of the tribulation, probably a statue picture. Who knows? But he's going to cause the world to worship him. All right, so uh, I mean, church won't be here though. We no, no, that's right. We will, we will be raptured. We're gonna, we're gonna go look at that too. Uh, but 
we got to make it, right? I want to be sure if I say that, recognize that. I'm, wait a minute, Lord. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, no, we, we're going to be, and I think I'm going to prove that today, okay? Yeah, okay. I'm going to I'm going to prove the rapture. Um, as best as I know how, it's, <clears throat> this is, of course, the rapture is something that has uh, uh, been a problem for some folks for a while, but I think if we follow, again, our pattern uh, in, in our uh, outline here of, 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 the, of, of the revelation of of uh, uh, the Olivet Discourse and just the pattern of eschatology, I think it's, you know, the only conclusion that you can come up with is the rapture of the church. Okay? All right, so we're at the midway point of the tribulation. Uh, we're going to continue that. Verse 15, again, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, or spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, again, that's the temple, right? That's the holy of holies. That is where the Ark of the Covenant is, the brazen altar. You remember the, uh, the, the, the bowl that had the water in it and had this lined with mirrors? That, that, uh, that's, that, that's in the Holy of Holies. We're talking about the place in the temple. Uh, that, that's where it happens. Listen to what it says. It says, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, i got a side note for you. All right? Uh, that's an important little phrase right there. Oftentimes, those who argue for the allegorical interpretation of end times, remember, we talked about that the first week. You got some folks out there that, that are in the camp of the amillennialists and the postmillennialists and the preterists and this and that, whatever, right? Uh, they're in that camp because they're, they interpret these events in the allegory, okay? Uh, and one of their uh, comments that that they have is that they find it hard to believe that our interpretation is correct because that would mean that the people sitting here listening to Christ would have no application for the Olivet Discourse. Okay? In other words, those people that were sitting there are not going to, or the disciples mainly, are not going to benefit from, from, from this teaching. They're not going to be a part of it. Right? Uh, and they would make the comment that the language sounds as though he's talking directly to them, right? Uh, and it does to, to, to a certain extent. Am I right? You know, if you're sitting there, you're listening, you're thinking this is all going to happen pretty quick, right? Until you get to this. It says, whoever reads, let him understand. So that, to me, implies that, that, that the author, which is Matthew, and the preacher, Jesus, intended this to be for a future audience. Amen? You agree? Okay? So, that's just a side note. I think that's worth noting. I, don't, I think they overlooked that. Uh, so, again, let's, we're, we're at the abomination of desolation, midway point of the tribulation. Uh, what is Jesus' warning? He says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. His warning for them is to flee, right? They are to flee. Uh, MacArthur says because of their proximity to the profaned temple headquarters of the Antichrist in Jerusalem, those who are in Judea will be in the greatest and most immediate danger from the extremely powerful and malevolent agent of Satan, that is, that is the Antichrist. Although everyone on earth will be subject to his tyranny, the Antichrist's supreme fury will be vented against Jews, regardless of their religious persecution or lack of it, and also against all Christians. Jewish Christians will be in the greatest jeopardy of all, being doubly despised by Satan's forces. All right, so, again, last week we already covered that level of persecution that takes place uh, that the Antichrist is going to unleash. Uh, and we've done that throughout the lesson. We've made reference to that. We've, we went back and looked at the, the parallel passages and all that kind of stuff. And basically, Hitler's Holocaust is going to pale into comparison compared to what the Antichrist will do. Remember Daniel says, such as never seen before, right? Uh, this is the greatest time. This is known as uh, Jeremiah's Jacob, a time of Jacob's trouble, right? So this is, this is uh, um, uh, we, we, we've already looked at that. So we're going to try again. We're trying to move along because we've already covered these things and we're going to get to the next event. Verse 17, it says, Let him who is on the housetop not to go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. 
All right, so this is the warning. So Jesus seems to indicate that not everybody's going to make it, right? Uh, in order to make that assumption, there also should be verses, uh, parallel passage that we confirm it, right? And there is. Zechariah talks about it. In Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9, it says, And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts, that's two-thirds, right? Two-thirds, and it will be cut off and perish. But the third will be left in it, and, will, and I will bring about, and I will bring the third part out through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Okay? That's, that's a tough of, test. It is. It is a tough test. All right, so he, he he tells them, flee to the mountains, right? Go to the mountains. Uh, again, that's probably to the east and south of Jerusalem. Uh, if you're looking at Israel on the map, uh, and you know, you stay, they, they, they're bordered by the mountains in the east, and especially south southeast, there's the cliffs and the caves of of the you know where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, you know, Mo, Moab and Edom and all that kind of stuff is there. Uh, that's modern, modern day Jordan, uh, uh, and then of course John in Revelation says the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman. Again, the woman is, is Israel, in order that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time. Again, how, how long is a time? Time is a year, right? And a times that's two years, right? And then two plus one is what? Three, correct? And a half a time. That means three and a half years, right? From the presence of the serpent. So they, they go to the wilderness, or as Jesus said, flee to the mountains. That's where they go. Uh, again, some of them don't make it. Inevitably, inevitably, there will be some there that will go back and get a cloak. It will be in the sun. It will be, you know, it may be in the winter, it may not. It may be on the Sabbath. Inevitably, some women are going to be pregnant. Those families that have a nursing wife, I imagine, will be part of those that don't make it. The husband trying to care for his wife as they run to to the uh, to the mountains will probably uh, both be captured. Families, children. It's going to be bad, right? Wrath of the Antichrist will be unleashed. It's uh, it's going to be worse than Hitler. Again, two thirds in Israel die. Two thirds of the Jews. <clears throat> Verse twenty-one it says, "For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time." That's how we know it's going to be worse than Hitler or any of them. It says, no, nor shall ever be. In both the books of Daniel, Daniel and Revelation make it clear that the Antichrist will uh, tyrannize the world for a time, times, and a half a time. That's three and a half years. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel chapter nine, 7 and uh, Daniel chapter 12, both. Revelation 12, 14, that's three and a half years. Again, we see this pattern. Three and a half, three and a half, three and a half. 1260 days, right? I don't know how we can be allegorical with that. I mean, just I mean, it, it just I, I can't I can't bring myself to be allegorical when it's so literal, a literal numbers, literal time frames, and it's and it, and it works so well. And they all the discourse, the, the the pattern, right, the outline, it works perfectly, doesn't it? Three and a half or seven years of the tribulation, midway point, the Antichrist puts his image up. Paul talks about it in 2 Thessalonians. I mean, it, the pattern is there, right? I don't know why we want to jump to the allegory. Well, I do know why. Uh, they were doing it in First and 2 Thessalonians, right? I mean, ultimately, that was the first false teaching. That was the first uh, confusing thing, if you will, of... Uh, of the of the end times teaching, the end times doctrines. Uh, somebody told, told the Thessalonians that it already happened, right? That's why they have such confusion. That's why we learn about the rapture. We'll go back and we'll look at that. But I mean, it's so plain. It's literal. It's a literal event that's taking place, or that will take place. 
Verse 22. He says, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Again, that's just a, a way of saying that it's going to be shortened. It's going to stop immediately. That's that shortened word. It's like an immediate end. Um, it's, it stops just short of total destruction, doesn't it? It's, it would, this would be disastrous forever when the wrath of this Antichrist, the power that he has driven by Satan, he would have killed everyone. That combined with the wrath of God on the ungodly, all those things would just be uh, unable to be stopped. All flesh would be dead, would, 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 would perish. Something I want to look at, though, is the false teachers. One thing that we haven't really covered much of this. Um, we mentioned it last week. Uh, there's a false prophet, false preacher saturate the end times, just like they saturate today. But evidently it will be uh, heightened during this, these last times. We see this theme of deception repeated frequently throughout the author discourse. If you take your little colored pencil, I think it's four or five times. If you just kind of uh, highlight, uh, if you will, the word deception or deceived, it's, it's, it's just something that happens. Uh, that's who the Antichrist is, right? He's one of deception. He deceived Eve. Uh, that, that, that's just who he is. That's his theme. Uh, and, and therefore, that is the theme of, of the eschatological passages, the end time passages, right? This deception or being deceived. Uh, look at verse 23. He says, then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it, um, you will have those during the end times that will, uh, I don't know if it's an attempt to lure the folks out of the caves, out of the mountains that Jesus has told them to flee from, or if it's just people in their midst who are trying to uh, uh, be worshipped, or trying to just, just deception in general. Uh, there will be those that say, look, there's Christ, or here He is, or whatever Christ says simply, do not believe it. He says, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. He says, see, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if any, if they say to you, look, He's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, He's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Again, quote MacArthur, he says, Satan is the father of lies. And since he first tempted Eve, one of his primary weapons has been deceit. He has done many, many times in the past and will uh, have already done many uh, times during the tribulation. Satan will inspire the appearance of the false Christ. Uh, again, the refugees will hear such claims as, Behold, here's the Christ, or there he is. Some of the false teachers will claim Christ in their own midst, and others will perhaps. Uh, claim that he's back and, and in Jerusalem or, or you know somewhere else and maybe in Judea. Uh, he says those spurious, spurious religious leaders, the false Christ and the false prophets, will even perform great signs and wonders, even supernatural evidence to support their claims. We know in Revelation, uh, let me just pause for a second, in Revelation we know that the Antichrist is, has, suffers a head wound, right? And as it were, dies. A little word in Revelation, as it were, that's a that's a phrase that means it looks like that, but it's not really. Okay, uh, he looks as though he, as he were dead, and then three days later he gets up, right? And that's um, the false prophet is part of that uh, preaching uh, his godliness, or, or you know his uh, you know causing the world to worship him. Evidently, these false prophets that arise have. These same uh, powers and signs and false wonders. Uh, again, we see it in Second Thessalonians. Paul says the same thing, right? With all lying signs and wonders. Remember that? When the man of lawlessness is revealed. We're going to go back and look at that in just a minute, but, but uh, just keep that in mind. All power, signs, and false wonders. Uh, and, and, and again, it's so convincing that it, you know, it could mislead, if possible, even the elect. How do we... As Christians, uh, and how will they, as Christians living during the tribulation, uh, understand what is truth? 
well, having our faith in Christ, but how do, how do, you know, this guy comes on the scene, right? And and he uh, he suffers a head wound. Perhaps uh, you watch it on TV. Somebody pops him in the head with a 45. Three days later, he gets up. You got this false prophet that's preaching this guy's a god, right? How do you know that's not real? Or how do you know that you can't? Or how do you keep from being deceived? How is it that we don't listen to those that say, "Hey, I've got a word from God, and it's something crazy"? Scripture, right? This is how we keep ourselves straight. Right? We learn biblical doctrine. We learn the Bible. Right? Somebody who comes to you and says, "I got a word from God," and it's somewhere out there, way out left field. First of all, if they say that to me, I'm gonna be like, "No, nah, I got the Bible. I'm good." Right? But, and when somebody says, you know, some TV preacher says, you know, you know, we're in Isaiah 35. If you give me thirty-five dollars, then God will bless you. That ain't in there, folks. You you too sharp on the Bible, right? They, they, they can't get you. That's why we memorize Scripture. All right, that's why we do this thing. This is how they're going to know. They're going to know because they're reading the Word. They're going to read Matthew 24. They're going to say, I know this guy's wrong because Jesus even said, some will come out and say, look, here he is. Look, there he is. You don't believe it. They're going to have great signs and mind wonders. I don't care if he... Uh, uh, you know, if he parts the Red Sea again, it's not going to convince me because Jesus said it would happen. Right? It don't matter if he gets up. It don't matter if demons are cast out. It don't matter what kind of miracles. Maybe I get a million dollars in, the, in my mailbox. It ain't going to convince me. It's all lies, right? Remember the Scriptures. It simply says, don't believe it. Why? Well, for one, it's no secret. He's not going to be sitting in Judea. He ain't going to come back and, you know, he's been here for a week and you didn't know. That's not the way that works, right? He's quick and sudden. Verse 27. He said, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be quickly. It's going to be sudden. It's not, it's not going to sneak up on you. Well, I mean, it's going to sneak up on you, but it's it's, it's going to happen. You're not going to you're not going to be uh, uh, in the dark about it. You're going to know that it's happened, correct? All right. Then, secondly, all will see. Says for wherever the carcasses is, there the eagles will be gathered. That's vultures, That's buzzards, right? We see them, you know, circling. That tells you the something down there, right? Everybody sees it. You know what that means. Uh, it's not. It's not. You're not going to have to guess. All's going to see it. All's going to know that he's there. And then that brings us to the second coming. The second coming. I want. I want to say this. This is the uh, most spectacular moment in human history. This event right here. It's the moment that you and I have been praying for. It's the moment that we've been hoping for. This is why we evangelize. This is why we memorize Scripture. This is why we pray. This is our hope. Right? It is the second coming of Christ. This is it. Listen to what Titus says. Or Paul says to Titus. Chapter 2, 11 through 14, he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, Righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Again, we hope, we're looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, right? This is in our very hearts. This is what we hope for. This is what we long for. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. is for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which, is, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but all those who have what? Loved His appearance. 
We look forward to the judgment of sin. We can't wait for the day that God will rid the earth of, of evil, iniquity, war, right? Watching this stuff on TV and look, looking at the, the war that's happening in, in Ukraine, God's going to eliminate that, right? The innocent death, our sin that, that is responsible for this, Look at the text. He says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, after the tribulation, there's going to be a time of what? Tribulation, right? We know that it's going to be seven years of tribulation, correct? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the earth, heavens will be shaken. The whole universe will begin to, to disintegrate. And then evidently it's going to happen with great... Uh, rapidity. It's going to be rapid. It's going to happen quickly. The sun and the moon will cease, cease to give light. The stars will even fall from the sky. From Luke's parallel ver, uh, account in, in Luke chapter 21, we learn that there will be uh, a dismay among the nations, perplexity and roaring of the sea and the waves. Men will faint from fear and the expectation of things which are coming upon the world. For the power of the heavens will be shaken. The events will be so calamitous that men will faint from absolute terror. That's a, that's a Greek word that means to expire, to stop breathing. Indicating really that people are just dying of fright. It's not a hurricane, a tornado, or a tidal wave. It's going to be the approaching Christ in all His glory that brings these men Faint. It's pretty intense, isn't it? This is Christ in all His glory. He says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Jesus Himself is that final sign, folks. And He's coming to judge. Listen to what it says. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming with, on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why are they mourning? Because they know judgment is near. Huh? You seen that video of that tank running over that old man in that car? Anybody seen that? This tank driving down the road from Russia, a Russia tank. Old man in a car. From Ukraine, just driving down the road, he just veers off and runs right over the top of him, crushes him. <clears throat> that guy in that tank, let me tell you something, he's going to mourn. He's going to mourn because he's going to see the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. This is the all powerful creator of heavens and the earth. The earth simply begins to disintegrate. Hebrew says that he upholds all things by the word of his power. All that's going to fall apart. He's holy. He's full of awe. He's awesome. The word awful and terrible will come back to their original meaning. Full of awe. Cause men to be full of terror. We'll describe Christ upon his return. He is coming to destroy evil. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 through 14. He says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given, this is Christ. Christ was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages shall serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. He is holy and glorious. Revelation 1, 7, and 8 says, Behold, He is coming with clouds. Every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. 
And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who was and is, and, excuse me, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. That's his um, omnipresence. That little phrase there, who is and was and is to come. God is not just everywhere all the time, right? Excuse me. He's not just everywhere. He's everywhere all the time, right? That means He's standing in yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And He is everywhere in His universe. The universe itself is finite. God is infinite. Who is and was and uh, is to come. He is the Almighty. And of course, you can't talk about the second coming of Christ and not also look at Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Again, this is this is it, folks. This is Him in all His glory. It says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, that's us, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself, treads, uh, that means rod of iron, that means if they sin, he brings them into judgment. There will be sin in the millennial kingdom, okay? But he'll bring it under judgment very quickly. He rules with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has, a ro- and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you could, just pencil in right under that Zechariah 14. I wasn't going to do this again, but we have to. Zechariah 14. You remember he tells them to flee to the mountains? We talked about that earlier. Yeah, y'all remember that? Why did he tell them to flee the mountain? Read this. This is, this is him coming back in all his glory. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Your spoil will be divided in your midst. He says, For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. Again, this is the battle of Armageddon. If you're, if you're wondering where it's at in the Revelation. The cities shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Ultimately, there will be some, again, that does, either doesn't listen to Christ, doesn't know that they should flee, or they didn't quite make it. Their houses will be rifled. The women ravished. Half the city is going to go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. What's the remnant? That's the ones that fled, right? Then the Lord will go fight forth and fight against those nations as He fights in the day of battle. And in that day His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. Think about that. Listen. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall be moved toward the north and half the mountain toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. He tells them to flee, doesn't he? Where do they go? They go to Azal. They go to the mountain, in the mountains and the cliffs and the caves. And then when he comes back with all his glory, he saves them. You see that? But he comes back in all his glory. I, I left too quickly. We tried to make a point and didn't think about what I was, where I was at. Now again, you know that Israel, midway through the tribulation, uh, at some point in the tribulation, usually is identified in the midway point, maybe a little before. There is a revival of Christianity within Jewish circles, right? Zechariah earlier says uh, that they recognize the one in whom they pierced. They know who, who Christ is. Again, you've got the 144,000 Jewish male virgins. They go out preaching and things like that. So there's a revival of the Jews. They realize Christ is the one who, whom, they, whom they pierced. He says, Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus, 
uh, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you, and it shall come to pass in that day there will be no light. Again, just like Jesus said, the lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day or night, but in the evening time it shall in the evening time it shall happen uh, that it will be light. And in that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, half of them toward the western sea. He just has a little snippet here that talks about the millennial kingdom. Uh and what actually happens uh, at his return uh, in in both summer and winter it it shall occur and the Lord shall be king over all the earth and in that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one all the land shall be turned into a plain from Gibeah to Rimmon south of Jerusalem Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel the king's wine press. The people shall dwell in it. No longer shall be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. This is what he says. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. And it shall come to pass in that day the great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. So such also shall be the plague on the horse and the mule and the camel and the donkey, and all the cattle will be in those camps, so shall this plague be. So when Christ comes back, he annihilates the enemies of, of Israel, right? He annihilates all unbelievers. As I'm writing my notes, I could really I could stay here forever. You see, we really can't. When you say you stand on your feet and your eyes dissolve and your body dissolve, it sounds like a nuclear bomb going on. Basically. That would be the sensationalist that's what, that's the right? quickness that he's going to do this. It's like, right. But uh, we'll see. That there's some of those sensationalists I told you about. That's what they say. Oh, that's a nuclear weapon. And that, that's that's yeah. Christ. Christ, Christ. That's Christ in his, the sword of his mouth, Revelation says. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't know. He, he might use a nuke. Who knows? But it, uh, really, it's rod. his... He's using that rod, that guy, when he goes... Doom. It's That's the it. sword of his mouth that comes out. Devours his enemies. Man, that's scary. Again, Hebrews talks about the word of his power. He upholds all things with the word of his power. Uh, Colossians says, in him all things consist. Uh, in Christ all things are held together. All this right here is just atoms, right? We're just atoms. We're all held together by, by Christ. All that comes apart, right? We should be thankful that he allows us to breathe, right? Right? I want to show you something else. Look at verse 31. This is important. All those who are saved during the tribulation, uh, the ones that are not killed, and you know, they're going to be fleeing. Perhaps they're going to be in jail, maybe being tortured. Uh, some will be hiding. But it says, But Christ will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. He gathers all His elect, and the reason he does that is because he's about to eliminate all the ungodly, all the ungodly people that follow the Antichrist. Um, his angels gather all those that are saved during the tribulation, right? He does that. We're going to jump to verse 36 real quick. I want to cover this. Um, it's just it, 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 we got to... Um, Verse 32, 32 through 35 is just a parable of the fig tree. <clears throat> um, it's just an illustration, if you will. When you see these signs, these things begin to take place, what he talked about earlier, then you know that it's, it's soon, it's, summer is nigh, it's here, it's close. Um, so uh, uh, it's just a parable. Again, I, it's worth looking into, but uh, I, I really want to get to this right here. Because this is confusing. Some people, some pastors, 
Um, again, those that are not very educated in this particular subject, um, those that, that, I don't know, just all across the board have said that this passage represents the rapture. I think this passage proves the rapture, but it's not the rapture. Okay, this is judgment, right? I mean, this is judgment. He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Right? They just don't know exactly what that, right? But as the days of Noah were, right? so he's liking this unto, unto the days of Noah, so also, also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 38, for as in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage. Some people think that that is, uh, you know, has something to do with the, the gross immorality. I think it's just basically saying this everyday life, right? They, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, giving in marriage. You know, just everyday life was happening. Up until when? Until the day that Noah entered the ark. It says, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Who did it take away in the flood? Non-believers. The non-believers, right? Thank you. It's pretty simple. This is talking about judgment. It's not talking about the rapture. It took away the non-believers, right? Every one of them. Okay, now some people say, now, again, I won't... I won't Let's get back on what we've been talking about. You know, you got the Island of Oracle guys and the, uh, uh, the historic premillennialist guys that believe uh, that the rapture and the second coming of Christ are all one event, the same. Okay. Uh, when this happens, what they're going to tell you is, is that those people that that are killed are the armies that are against Jerusalem, you have the battle of Armageddon, that's obvious, we know that happens, right? That God destroys all of the armies at the battle of Armageddon. As a matter of fact, it says, you ever heard the phrase, the, the blood was up to the horse's bridle? That's what that's talking about. There's going to be such massive uh, carnage at the battle of Armageddon that the blood is going to be as high as the horse's bridle. It's going to be awful, right? All the armies are perish at the, at the, at the return of Christ. Right? But this also indicates after the, the, the angels gather together God's elect, the judgment comes to all those who are left. He says that they did not know that the flood came and took them all away, so will the, the coming of the Son of Man be. It says that two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. One's a believer, one's an, an unbeliever, right? The one that's taken is the unbeliever. He's taken in the flood of judgment. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Correct? So this is global, is it not? This is going to happen in Tennessee, in Alabama. It's going to happen everywhere. Just as it happens in Israel, in Judea, in China, and in Russia. All over the world. He says, watch therefore you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Pause just for a moment. Now, let's play this out. We know that it's total. That's total, right? So we've got tribulation, right? Anybody that knows, uh, familiar with the study of end times, we like charts, right? All right. A thousand years, right? Seven years, correct? Yes, no, yes. maybe. All right. We don't know exactly, or we can't point to a definitive verse or passage 
that says the rapture of the church happens right now. All right? Now, it's assumed. One, you read, it's, it's, it's the context by which you interpret uh, First and Second Thessalonians, that you assume that that's what they're talking about. And now if you're a non-millennialist, you're going to say, no, nah, that's not what they're talking about. You know, you don't have, they didn't think it already happened. Uh, or something like that. That's not what they're talking about. Uh, when when First Thessalonians, we'll go. We'll, we're going to read that in just a second. I'm just kind of setting this up. Uh, they're going to say that the wrath to come is talking about hell. It's talking about just general salvation uh, for mankind in general from the wrath to come, which is hell, uh, right? And and that's true. We were saved from the wrath to come in the sense that we don't go to hell, right? But we would say that it's that that, that particular verse is, is making reference to the wrath to come of the tribulation the antichrist right uh, so here's the deal what is he talking about alright this event right here the, the, the end right coming of Christ it's in, it's in totality right it's total judgment on the world Going somewhere with this, all right? Pay attention. It's not just the armies, correct? That means everybody going into this millennial kingdom here is saved, does it not? Make sense? All right. If the rapture and the second advent of Christ, the second coming of Christ, are one event in the same, all right? That means those that are going into the millennial kingdom have glorified bodies. You know, that, that's one of the great, awesome hopes and expectations of, of the resurrection is that we get a glorified body, right? Well, what happens with our glorified bodies? One, we don't grow old, right? We don't no. grow old. There's no wrinkles. No sickness. No. Arthur and Ritus, they're gone, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Malignancy and terminal are words that don't are not mentioned anymore, right? But the best thing is not our our, our eternal deal where we, we, we live eternally. The best thing is that, that we never ever sin again. I will never again bring reproach to God. I will never again sin against God. There will be no more lust. No no greed, no no nothing. I'm going to be made like Christ. Perfect. Holy. I'll never sin again. Right? What is happening at the end of the millennial kingdom? Infos that know. At the end of the millennial kingdom, there's a rebellion, right? Satan's released from the abyss to tempt the world one more time. For a short time, it's real short. They march on Jerusalem. After he rules a perfect world for a thousand years, they march on Jerusalem. Now, what did the what happened when the Sadducees asked Jesus? Remember the girl uh, whose husband she had bad luck in marriage. You know that her husband died. Seven of them died. Remember? They they looked at her and because they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad. You see, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. They didn't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. So they was asking him, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? They are trying to trap him. And he said, you goofballs. He said, y'all don't know the scriptures. He said, there's no families in heaven. There's no procreation, right? There's no need for it. There's no, nothing like that. We have, I don't, I don't know, but we, just, we, we don't have children. We don't have families in general. We're made perfect. We don't have those desires or anything like that. We're, our focus is Christ and His glory and alone. We're made perfect, correct? There's no families or anything like that. Who's rebelling at the end of the millennial kingdom? If we have a total destruction of all unbelievers and those that go into the millennial kingdom uh, are saved, and if you are a post-tribulationalist, you follow me? Then you believe we all, that this event is one and the same. We all go up, get glorified with uh, Christ coming, and then we go into the millennial kingdom. And for a thousand years, we're great. 
Even your most staunch Arminian who believes that you can lose salvation believes when we get resurrected and saved that we don't lose salvation anymore. Right? We don't believe that you can lose salvation at all. But even those guys, even your your most legalistic Pentecostal that believes you can lose salvation believes when you get your resurrected body there is no loss of salvation anymore. Right? So there's no kids, there's no resurrection, or there's no... Uh, rebellion in us, or anything like that, yet there's a rebellion at the end of king. The only way this happens is if you have a pre-tribulational rapture of the church, pre-trib, you have seven years of the tribulation that go by, there will be people that are saved during those tribulations, or during that tribulation, when Christ comes back, destroys the world, all the evil people that, that exist, the saved that were saved here go into the millennial kingdom with carnal, fleshly bodies just like you and I have right now. They'll live, they'll die, they'll marry, they'll have children, and their children will be the ones that rebel in the millennial kingdom after a thousand years. You and I, we come back with Christ. We conquer with Christ. We, we, we are... We have our perfect bodies. We no longer sin. Does that make sense? The rapture has to happen. Now, we're going to assume, and I think rightfully so, that that is the original teachings of the apostles. And then we're going to go and look at 1 Thessalonians. I mean, either that, we can assume that all that's uh, hogwash and uh, it's all out of order. We're already living right here. That means Zechariah 14 has already happened. Everything we've studied has already taken place. Does that make any sense? Not at all, right? I mean, I, I, can, I cannot do that. I, I cannot. I just can't. I can't look at Zechariah 14 and see Christ coming back, step a foot on the Mount of Olives, and say, yep, that's allegorical. That's already happened. We're living over here. I, I, I can't do it. I don't, it doesn't matter. I mean, this, just, this is just the way it is. All right. Chapter 4. What is going on here in, in, the, in the Thessalonian church? Paul had a problem in Thessalonica. Okay. Paul had a problem. Somebody, I think it was the first preterist or amillennialist or something like that, they came in and uh, they interpreted eschatological events allegorically. All right? I like to make that joke. Now, but that's just what I think. I think this, this is how early it started, folks. Okay? You see it all throughout church history. They've argued this for a long time. This doctrine that we believe in is not just 150 years old like some of them would have you believe. We've argued this from the from day one. Or actually from day whatever day uh, the Thessalonian letters were written. Okay? What's the problem? Somebody has come into the church at Thessalonica and said, hey, the day of the Lord's already happened. Right, we're living. Christ has already done His thing. We've already seen the tribulation. We're in the millennium kingdom. He says, but I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. I don't want you to be unaware, right? Don't be ignorant. It's without knowledge. That's not stupid or, or foolish or anything like that. It's just without knowledge. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, concerning those who have died, your, your Christian brothers and sisters. Lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. We don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope, right? Why? Because there's going to be a resurrection, Right? It's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry for a saved mama, a saved dad, a saved son, a friend, or something like that. But we don't have to grieve like the pagans who have no hope of ever being reunited, right? He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, 
The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, or in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, one preacher said they got a, they rise uh, the dead rise first because they got six feet further to go, right? We're going to meet them in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord, therefore com- comfort one another with these words. Listen to what he says now. Chapter 5. First Thessalonians, he says, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Again, you've got some Yehu that has come into the church preaching something different than what Paul's been teaching, right? He says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. He He's talking about the end. The same thing Jesus has been talking about and all that. He's already given them the plan and the, and, and the program, right? He's already walked them through the seven years of the tribulation and the thousand-year reign of Christ, correct? All right, now, they may not know, know it was a thousand years at this time. John hadn't been written yet, or Revelation hadn't been written yet. But he's done walked them through the program, correct? Uh, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. You're not going to be part of it. Right? That's the darkness. The tribulation is the darkness. You are not in darkness. So this is so that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. We don't have to act like everybody else, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and, the, and as a helmet of salvation, or excuse me, as a helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to what? What wrath? The wrath of the tribulation, correct? But to insane salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Uh, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also have done. All right, jump over to Second Thessalonians. Chapter 2. Does that make sense? You follow that? I'm telling you folks, if you put yourself in the context of the Bible and you study the Scriptures and you study it correctly, this stuff is easy to understand, right? Second Thessalonians. You still got this guy who, who's, who's monkeying around in the church. Paul can't make it to Thessalonica to, to, to correct him, uh, you know, verbally. Or, you know, when he does, he comes back after he's gone and he says, no, 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 blah, blah, blah. And he's got this allegorical interpretation and he, and he sounds so good. He's got this nice, you know, neat and syllabus and everything. And it's just so amazing. He just a dynamic preacher. Whatever. Listen to what. Listen to what Paul says. Now, brethren, he says concerning the coming of our uh, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask that you not be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by word, excuse me, either by spirit or word or by letter, as if from us. So not only is this guy not telling them the truth, but he's acting like he's from them. Right? He's he's writing a letter and he's signing it, Paul. Okay. Now. Again, if we follow this question uh, or, or this concern, he says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. Now, if we follow this out, and if we make that the, the, the point of this, then, then it seems like this, our gathering together to Him is after the revealing of the Antichrist. But that's not what he's saying here. All he's saying here is he's talking again about the end. This is what's concerning them. They think that they're going to be raptured. There's going to be a tribulation, and this guy is telling them that we've already that this stuff has already taken place, right? He's telling them that this all this event's already taken place. Look, that event's not taking place yet. He again, what does he do? He goes back to the program, back to the outline, time and time again, doesn't he? He says, "Don't be soon shaken." In mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Uh, that, that is uh, the word apostate. Uh, some people think that, that means that there's going to be a great uh, apostasy before the tribulation that a lot of people 
uh, in the church is going to leave the church uh, or something like that. I, I think ultimately he's talking about the Antichrist, his nature, uh, this apostasy, this falling away, this turning around is when the Antichrist sets his image up in the temple as God. And, and that, that's ultimately, and the world begins to follow him, right? That's, that's the event that's talk, that he's talking about. Okay? And, and he goes on, and, and the, the, you can tell that that's exactly what he's talking about throughout the rest of this, uh, this chapter. He says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. Who's the man of sin? Antichrist, right? The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple, showing himself to be God. We've already established what that is, right? We already know what that's talking about. Everybody following? Any questions so far? We have no time left, but we're going to continue, right? It's the midway point of the tribulation, right? And my Christ puts his image up in the temple. That's the abomination of desolation. You following? Opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So it takes, again, it takes place in the temple. He's showing himself to be God. Maybe he's sitting there. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? I told you these things that reverberates in a pastor's mind over and over and over again. I told you these things, yet you still watch Joe Osteen, or you still do this or that, right? I told you these things. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Something's restraining the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness would do this right now. He would have done it with Hitler, and I think that that's what he was ultimately trying to do, right? He would have done it with Stalin, Mao. He'd do it right now with Putin or whoever. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains him will do so till he's taken out of the way. The rapture of the church is going to happen. The restraining power of the Holy Spirit is going to be pulled away from a particular leader. And then the lawlessness will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of His mouth and destroy with the brightness of His coming. And the coming of the lawless one is in accord to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Again, folks, we're going to stop right there. But it's just a pattern. It's an outline. It's easy to understand. It's not that hard. It's simple and it's literal, right? You just follow the program that's been spelled out from day one. Amen? Let's pray. Father, again, thank you so much for your word. Uh, I love to return to these, these topics time and time again. Lord, I love your appearing. I pray that I can say to Paul that I've fought the good fight, that I've run the race. Finally, Lord, there's reserved for me the crown of righteousness whom you do, will deliver on that day. Lord, we know that there's coming a day when there's going to be a rapture of the church. We, we will be a part of this great reunion. And even when we see all of our loved ones, wives and husbands and sons and daughters, moms and dads, we see all those. It's going to be great. But nothing will be as great as seeing you. Nothing will be as great as treading that crystal sea bowing to the burnished bronze feet, looking into the eyes of the man in white, kissing those burnished bronze feet of the one who purchased us with his own blood. Worthy, worthy, worthy are you, O Lord, to receive honor and power and great glory. For you have saved us by your blood. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.